All right, break out your best flannel because the Georgetown Fall Market is going to happen on October 14th and 15th. More than 30 Georgetown businesses will host in-store and sidewalk sales along Wisconsin Avenue. You can enjoy a pumpkin painting competition, live music, outdoor dining, face painting, and more free activities, all while you shop for the best fall finds from your favorite small businesses. Visit georgetownmainstreet.com slash fallmarket to plan your weekend. That's georgetownmainstreet.com slash fall market. Today on CityCast DC, there have been a lot of buzzy new restaurant openings in DC lately, but don't forget about those durable DC staples that fly under the radar, but endure for a reason. The Washingtonian's food critic, Ann Limpert, joins me and newsletter editor, Kayla Cody Stemmerman, to dish on DC's most underrated restaurants. Today's Wednesday, October 11th. I'm Bridget Todd, and here's what DC is talking about. So I think it makes sense to start this conversation with getting clarity from you both on what you think of as an underrated restaurant. Like, what, how do you define an underrated restaurant? So I would define it as a place that does what it sets out to do really well, but for whatever reason, doesn't get a lot of like word of mouth hype, doesn't get any love on social media. It's probably a pretty easy table to get on like resi or open table. Um, and there, you know, there are several reasons yeah. for that, but... I think places that have that have, yeah, sort of been forgotten about, or maybe they were really popular when they opened, and you know now like people talk about them less. Um, you know, neighborhood joints that are just just like really good standbys that don't get the press that a lot of these you know newer places do. So Kayla, for you, it's like punching above their weight, right? Like yeah, they're doing what they're setting out to do, and they're doing that thing well. They might not be. TikTok viral, but they're doing the thing and they're doing it well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually hope they're not TikTok viral for my own. For my <laughs> own you sake. Keep going. I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> not to gatekeep, but a little bit. <laughs> so let's talk about some of these. And what are a few of the spots on your underrated restaurant list? Taking a little cue from what um, Kayla said, like the once buzzy places that are now, they, they used to be really hard to get into. Um, one of my favorites is Convivial, which when it opened um, several years ago, we back then we ranked our 100 best restaurants list. And three months after it opened, we put it at number four. So it was a hard table to get for like, you know, a couple of years. And I think it's just the location doesn't really do it any favors. It's in Shaw. It's a central location, but it's kind of tucked away, like right by the giant. The dining room is fine and comfortable, but not doesn't have like the theatrical scene of like a Le Diplomat. But the food there is like so excellent. What what type of food is it? I've never been. French. So it's the chef is named Cédric Montpellier. He came up under Michel Richard at some fine dining French restaurant. So it's pretty like traditional French these days. When it opened, it was they had like a Coco Van fried chicken. Now it's a lot more kind of by the book, but it's still really great. Got to check it out. Have yeah. you been, Bridget? I've not been. I love French food. Honestly, it has been on my list since it first was like this buzzy place that would have been difficult to get into. Now it seems like the time to go, right? It's like totally. a yeah. little less buzz, mm -hmm. but still doing their thing well. And still, Yeah, it's still great. I went about a month ago and it was excellent. And do you have to like prepare yourself when those like top 100 restaurant lists come out to like know that you're not gonna be able to get reservations at your favorite spots for like a good six months? Well, the nature of my job is that I don't really get to go back to my favorite spots all that often. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are always That's too many fair. new ones to check out. But yeah, I, I mean, Anju was one that we named it number one a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic. And I was like, God, I really want that fried chicken. <laughs> I know. Oh, that's such and a good deal, back. too. I know. I love this category of once buzzy, kind of hard to get into places that are still like, even though the buzz has died down, are still quite good. Are there others in that category? I would say for me, um, Cork is one. I remember when Cork opened and like, I think it was like 2014, there was a two hour wait to get in there. Oh, my God. And it's just, you know, it's like a little neighborhood wine bar. It's great, but it's not like gunning for a Michelin star or anything. And 
the menu is very similar to what it was back then. They're still like the same, like fried shrimp and chicken liver pate. And it has moved. It moved across 14th Street. But it's a great little wine destination. Great place to learn about wine. One one also that comes to mind is Maketo. I feel like that that one still gets quite a bit of hype. But when it first opened, it was just like so hard to get reservations. And it was kind of one of the only places in the city that had that style of the cafe and the garden and the, the shop underneath. Um, and it was a very like unique experience. And they're still doing great stuff. I mean, it's still so good. And even more things have popped up around it that, you know, you can go to. But I often don't see it on, you know, on lists anymore these days. Yeah, Maketo, I feel like, you kind of put this well, they were really on to something that I think became a bigger thing in the area. Like you, they have a little shop there so you could leave with, you know, I think I bought a hat there the last time I was there. <laughs> you don't think of going out to eat as also being a shopping destination, but Absolutely. Maketo, it definitely is. And I think that they were on to something that is now more commonplace in DC, maybe. Another one of those kind of buzzy, but maybe buzz has died down spot is Hank's Oyster Bar, which I've actually never been to, despite loving You've oysters. You've never been to Hank's Oyster, Oyster Bar? No. <laughs> I don't think that Hank's Oyster Bar is underrated. <laughs> I would say it's perfectly right. I feel like it's fine. Is that not how other people feel? I think it does a really good job with that, like, New England traditional seafood category. I think that they have the best lobster roll in town. And it's great for oysters. Um, they do great, great, great cocktails also. Another one in that category that I is like, I've only been there once, but it was near and dear to my heart, Iron Gate. I think if you are, if you have a special occasion, they have this, um, the food is to die for, it's phenomenal. But also they have this like outdoor patio with fire tables. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so romantic. It is really romantic. If you, if you are trying to impress a date, but you and you don't mind a little bit of a splurge, that is the spot to go in my book. Absolutely. Yeah, I love Iron Gate. I think whenever like my parents are in town, you know, I'll take them <laughs> to Iron Gate or like whenever I'm, yeah, like trying to sort of impress somebody, it's always good. You know, I think it's a great choice also for like restaurant week when you don't necessarily want to spend the money, I think it's very romantic. And it's not, again, it's not like hype right now. It's not that hard to get a reservation, but it's very solid, very solid. I also think that their outdoor space is so beautiful and it has been that way for years. And even after, you know, during the pandemic, so many people, sort of so many restaurants put all of this effort into their outdoor spaces. I still think Iron Gate beats them all. And like atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, you can sit out there in the middle of winter and it's like warm mm -hmm. and nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The brand new Arbor at Tacoma is built for your most convenient urban living. Whether you want to enjoy the vibrant Tacoma DC community or comfortably retreat into a sleek sanctuary all your own. The kitchens have striking dark navy and white cabinets and throughout the home, there are wood floors and smart home technology. Some homes even have a private outdoor space. With a quick walk to the metro, you can easily head into downtown or stay close and enjoy the retail that's on site. Located at 218 Cedar Street Northwest, the Arbor Tacoma offers brand new one and two bedroom condos starting in the upper 300,000s. Visit thearborattacoma.com for more information. That's Tacoma with a K. So T-H-E-A-R-B-O-R-A-T-T-A-K-O-M-A.com. Picture this, you're at the airport or strolling through the grocery store, and suddenly there they are, someone who seems tailor-made for you. You know that feeling, right? That instant connection you can't ignore. But then they leave. Another missed connection? Not so fast. Introducing Never Missed, the revolutionary dating app that turns those chance encounters into unforgettable beginnings. It's simple. Download the Never Missed app for free right now on the App Store or on Google Play. In just moments, you'll be ready to transform fleeting glances into lasting connections. Don't let serendipity slip through your fingers. Embrace the possibility and excitement of finding your someone right when you least expect it. Download the Never Missed app and make your story of how you met an unforgettable chapter in your journey. Another very cool thing about DC that I think is unique is that there are a lot of old school places that have been doing what they're doing for 30 years in this city. Maybe they don't get a lot of attention on social media, but they are durable for, and they're old standbys for a reason. What are some of those places? 
One of my favorites is Vache, the pizza place. It's my first food memory. I mean, Vache and I are kind of the same age. Um, <laughs> but I remember being five years old and sitting in the back of my, my mom's car and eating a piece of pizza. And I ate a piece of pizza in my car, you know, like a week ago from there. I love it so much. It's super affordable too, especially now that a pizza will run you like $28. You can get a really excellent pie for like, I think it's like 15 now. They just raised it. <laughs> Yeah, so good. Oh, my God. And when you mentioned Vache, and not only did you have, like, a visceral reaction, Kayla did it. It's a podcast that folks can't see. Kayla did a little dance. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's good. <laughs> she hasn't been. I mean, sometimes I work, I, like, Vache is one place that I feel like if it closed, I think it would feel like a death. Like, I love that place. It's so entwined in my life, because I grew up here, and so I... It, you know, I grew up eating the frozen tortellini and and I worry that I take it a little bit for granted because all that said, I've probably written about it maybe twice in the 20 years I've been writing about food. Heidelberg Bakery, I can speak to. That's a good spot. I didn't realize that it had been there for a really long time. And I'm, I've only gone a couple of times, but I didn't realize that it had this like durability in the area. Yeah, they do great breakfast pastries too. It's a place that like I didn't really know what to make of it at first. You know, it's like a bread bakery and they do sausages and they do that it's a market. But I think it really stands out for they do really good donuts and do good breads too. One place on that list that I would call out is Chris Field in Silver Spring. Have you been there? I have not. No. It has been there forever and it looks it like they have not changed that dining room. It is like has so much character. There are like antique beer steins and oyster plates lining the walls. They probably still have like the Andes mints by the cash register, <laughs> but it is <laughs> really old school Maryland, you know, like Eastern shore seafood. Very simple, like crab sauteed in butter. And you sit at this little horseshoe bar and they give you beer in these little jelly glasses. And it's totally great. Sounds ideal oh God, right this, now. This is, yeah. you're speaking my language. Really yeah. <laughs> So the kind of category in the middle of like once buzzy places where the buzz has kind of died down and then old standbys are kind of neighborhood spots that punch above their weight but get left out of the conversation. Do you have any of those for us? Um, I think so. Rekuya in DuPont Circle, I think, is one. And I think that that was a little bit of a victim of its past. I mean, so it opened in like 1995 as Reku and out of town celebrity chef opened it. The Asian fusion craze kind of peaked and then became uncool. And it was always kind of viewed as it sits right on DuPont Circle. And so I think people always viewed it as like, oh, it's just getting by on its location because it's so visible. But in 2016, they rebranded, they like relaunched the menu and became Rakuya. And they have one of the best happy hours in town. Their lunchtime bento is excellent. Their sushi is great, really creative. Yeah, I love they have like that out now that they've closed down that, what is it, R Street there, that segment. They have like a, a ton of outdoor seating. It's like never, you can almost always get a table. It's very casual. I, yeah, it's great. I used to go there all the time. It's so funny that you mentioned the location. I think something about the location made me not want to try it. Something about the, there, there might be a victim of having too good of a spot. Because something about it is like, oh, they're just trying to get tourists who just need to go in somewhere. But I guess that's not the case. No, but I actually think you're totally right. And I think another place like that is Red Light, which has this mm. like primo 14th and I think it's 14th and R location. Yeah. And they have this really like boozy outdoor drinking, you know, bar scene. And I think people just think of it as a bar. Think of it as a place to go drink, not to get a really excellent pizza. But their Detroit style pizza is really, really good. A pastry chef spent a lot of time working on that dough. It's like one of the only places to get Detroit style pizza in DC, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kayla, as our neighborhood, like newsletter expert, what are your neighborhoody spots that you feel like punch above their weight, but like maybe don't get the shine they deserve? One that I go to an embarrassing amount is I think it's pronounced veggies, V-E-G-Z in Admo. It's like a vegetarian Indian, like very casual Indian spot. They do like dosas and a lot of like chats and like just, just so good. Like it just feels like a very neighborhood vibe. Like there's three tables in there. Everything's served in like paper plates, but it's the flavors are, are so good. I always like 
always go back. It's very cheap, maybe like 12 or $13 for a home, like for a dinner, for a meal. Yeah, I really, I highly recommend. It does get crowded sometimes on like week, you know, like Fridays, Saturdays. I try not to crowd it out too much for me guys, but I do recommend. Well, that is now on my list. I actually have not tried it. Oh, it's so good. You should go. Bridget, what about you? Do you have any? Neighborhood spots that punch above their weight. The Imperial and the Adams Morgan, they have a really good happy hour. They have two lovely rooftop spaces, and I love an outdoor rooftop sitch. Great view. And their drinks are just great. They've got oysters. I love their brunch. Um, that's a place where I take my parents when they come, because it's like there's, they've got something to please everybody. They might not get the shine. I think they might be related to Jack Rose in some, in some capacity. Um, so Jack Rose certainly gets the shine, but uh, Imperial, check it out. Well, have you all been? Let me no. just point out that the Imperial's happy hour is on the cover of our magazine. Oh, really? okay. Well, okay. All right. So, <laughs> but I agree no, with you. Like, plug. No one's ever heard of it. It's my little hidden gym, y'all. Yeah. Like, <laughs> just on the cover of this like massive nationally syndicated <laughs> magazine. No big deal. <laughs> You have good taste. What can I say? I mean, that's that's sort of a larger conversation is like, there are some of these places that are genuinely hidden gems, underrated. But I feel like in a city like DC, is anything ever really like a hidden gem? Like if you ever scroll TikTok, people will be like, oh, here's a little hidden gem in DC. And it's like the diplomat. It's like it's not <laughs> it's like, a hidden gem at all. Nobody thinks that's hidden, babe. Yeah. Well, I mean, all of these places have to have their followings. Otherwise they'd close. Cause I mean, DC is not a cheap place to operate a, a restaurant, especially the places with longevity. Um, yeah. So a lot of the places that we've talked about are in DC, the district proper. Are there places y'all want to shout out that are outside of DC in the burbs? One that I would start off with, which is like my absolute favorite place ever um is lighthouse tofu cafe in annandale it's like a korean spot they have like hot tofu soup and like you get an like truly an incredible amount of food for like 12 dollars. it's like this steaming bowl of soup like rice all the banchan like barley tea like it's a whole experience and it's like very casual it's much more low-key than like going to a korean barbecue I'm not sure. I like when people there, they're like, oh my God, like I never knew this existed. Probably because, you know, people don't get out there that often. But if you are out in Annadale, I would really, I really highly recommend. Seconded. I love that place. Actually, one other suburban place, Frankly Pizza. Have you been there? No, where is it? It's in Kensington. You have to like know it's, it's tucked away and it's tiny. And I believe they don't take reservations. It's, and it's hard to get into, which there's my coffee. Challenge. <laughs> It is like one chef making all the pizza. He cures his own bacon. And there's one pie that they do. It's called the hot mess. And it's like jalapenos, that house cured bacon. It is worth, it's like worth schlepping to Kensington. It's worth standing in line. (laughs) All the hassle. Nice. I'm hearing a field trip in our future. I'm learning it's pizza for you, Anne. Yeah, this is the oh second time you've had a, a, a real reaction. Like a, like, Actually, it's the third, I think. A third. Vache, <laughs> yeah, red, I red light. I love red light. <laughs> it's, it's pizza for Anne. <laughs> I have it every Friday night. It's like my break. <laughs> <laughs> Kayla, Anne, thank you for being here. I will see y'all out and about, probably with a face full of food. I hope so. Thanks, Bridget. Before you go, here's some quick news. A hacking group says it's breached D.C.'s Board of Elections records, accessing 600,000 lines of voter data. The group, Ransom VC, says it's now selling the data on the dark web. Federal and local law enforcement are investigating the hack, but for now, the Board of Elections has shut down its website and is conducting vulnerability scans of its networks. Meanwhile, Truist Bank has donated the hotly debated Adams Morgan Plaza to a nonprofit to build affordable housing. The bank had been planning to develop luxury apartments there, triggering severe backlash from neighbors who wanted the space as a public square. And lastly, Sugarloaf Mountain in Frederick County, Maryland, has reopened to the public. It had been closed since August after a burglary attempt at a mansion on the property. The park, known for scenic views and beautiful trails, now has increased security measures, including cameras and stricter hours. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, share it with your favorite foodie. We'll be back tomorrow morning with even more news from around the city. Talk to you then.